So if you open your red books, number 11, we will begin. Sounds like it's on. Number 11 in the red book. <clears throat> Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor, give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard His children. In His arms He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the Crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, hell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, live forever and ever. Praise Him, praise Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. If you care to mark your books, our uh, song of encouragement will be 642. 642. Dear Heavenly Father, hallowed be thy name. Lord, we do thank thee that we can assemble here together openly and freely midweek to sing songs of praise to you, uh, to open your word and study more from it. We would ask that you would be with Wade as he teaches us tonight, that he would do things in accordance with your will that we would be attentive to the things that are being taught and that we would remember those things, Lord. We thank you for the technology um, that we do have so we can go back and, and look at those things when we forget. Uh, please be with those who could not make it tonight. Um, if they are sick, uh, please heal them with your healing hand and help us to help them in any way possible. We thank you. Um, for the congregation, Lord, for the church in itself, that uh, we can be with like-minded people, and that also in times of trouble that we can lean on one another. Uh, we just ask for your forgiveness where we have erred, and in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, kids, you can head to your class. tell you about 622 I'm always wondering how we're all going to get here but then I get up here and you're here so it's just amazing good to see you all this evening tonight we're going to be uh, working our way through the primarily through the ninth chapter of 
Revelation, and um, we're starting to get into some more um, intricate uh, pieces of prophecy that uh, kind of require a little bit more time to unpack. And uh, I'd like to take a few minutes this evening just to go back and do a fair amount of review just to kind of set the stage. And uh, I think it's probably right for me to say that we're beginning to head into some areas of history that we might be less familiar with than maybe some of the things about the Roman Empire. Uh, any of us that took world history back in high school probably had a fair amount of material on Rome, but we're beginning to get into some areas that we might not know too much about and uh, the the imagery, the symbolism begins to get a little bit more detailed, a little bit more difficult to, to interpret. So chapters 9, 10, and 11 are going to take quite a bit of time, and that's going to pretty much continue on into chapters 12 and 13. So uh, to begin with, though, I'd like to just kind of take us all the way back to seal number one, where this series of events begins. Seal number one represents the age of the Antonines, which is a period of time that lasts from 96 to 180 AD. It's a period of time during which five very capable men ruled the Roman Empire. And it's during this time period that Rome reaches its greatest extent under the Emperor Trajan. And this map up here on the board just shows how big the empire was. It stretches all the way in the north up into uh, England, all the way south down into Egypt, all the way east over to what we would call Iraq and a little bit of Iran, and all the way west to Portugal and uh, the Straits of Gibraltar. So it's quite large in 117. But by the time we get to seal number six, things are beginning to change. And seal number six has to do with the reign of Constantine and the reforms that Constantine undertook as emperor of, the, of, of Rome. And one of the major developments in the reign of Constantine was moving the capital from Rome to Constantinople, which is the modern day Istanbul in Turkey. And uh, I don't know how well you can see Constantinople, it's it's right here on the map. Is that working? Are you getting like a little laser pointer there? There we go. Yeah, yeah there we go. Yeah. So Constantinople's right there. And by 395, the, the empire was basically split into two halves. There was the west that was ruled by Rome and the east that was ruled by Constantinople. And that sets the stage for the Byzantine Empire, which if you have been following along in the study guide, you had a little introduction to the Byzantine Empire that I included from the Encyclopedia Britannica. And I included that because that may be a, a part of history that we're just not all that familiar with, but it's going to play an important role in the fifth and sixth trumpets the next few weeks. So going back to last week, we looked at seal number seven which I understand to be a, a brief interlude between the, the reign of Constantine and the beginning of the trumpets. And in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 through 5, we have this very dramatic scene. An angel appears with a golden censer. He stands at the altar, and he was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. As I mentioned last week, one of the things that impresses me about this imagery is how many times the, the prayers of the saints are included. And it looks to me like What's about to transpire in the trumpets is God's response to the pleas of his people. And in particular, I think back to seal number five, which if you think back to seal five, John sees 
disembodied souls underneath the altar, and those souls represent people who have given themselves for the cause of Jesus Christ. And they want to know how long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Now, in a sense, that begins in seal number six with the reorganization of the Roman Empire under Constantine, and in particular, Constantine adopting Christianity as the uh, prime religion of Rome, replacing the pagan religion, which had been traditionally the religion for many centuries. But I really see these trumpets as God's response to the pleas of his people. Rome has been terrible to them, and God is not going to allow Rome's treatment of his church to go unpunished. So what I see happening in the four trumpets are God's response to the prayers of his people. So as we went through last week, the four trumpets represent four barbarian invasions of Rome. And I say barbarian because that's how the Romans described them. But quite frankly, these, these tribes, these Germanic people were actually more civilized in some respects than the Romans were. For example, they had uh, a much more traditional family unit, much more so than, than Rome did at this time. So Rome may have called them barbarians, but in some respects they were far more civilized than the Romans were. This begins with the Goths who were led by Alaric and they sacked Rome in 410 AD. This is the first trumpet. That's the first time in nearly 800 years that Rome has been sacked. Trumpet number two represents the Vandals who were led by Jusseric. They sacked Rome in 455 AD. Trumpet three represents the Huns under Attila. Now they don't sack Rome. They come to the gates of Rome and Attila is persuaded by Pope Leo to uh, take his army and head back to the north. And that's what he does. Eventually he dies and his army buries him in the Danube River. Trumpet number four is the, the culmination. This is the moment when Odiacer leads a, uh, a coalition of barbarian tribes in, 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 in an invasion of Italy, and they eventually take the city of Rome. The city falls in 476, and this brings an end to that western half of the Roman Empire that you saw on that map a couple of slides ago. So the Western Empire essentially falls. Odiacer turns all of the Western Empire, with the exception of Italy, over to the rule of the Eastern Empire. He just keeps Italy for himself. It later becomes the kingdom of the Ostrogoths a couple of decades later. So these four trumpets are the, the first response of God to the pleas of his people to avenge their blood on those who had persecuted them. And somebody asked me this question after the study last week, and I just thought it might be good to take a moment to maybe make this a little bit more clear than maybe I did in the study last week. So there is this very interesting part of the trumpets. In each of the trumpets, there, there's one third of the empire that's affected by each trumpet. So in trumpet number one, one third of the trees were burned up. In trumpet number two, one third of the sea becomes like blood. In trumpet number three, one third of the rivers and springs of water become bitter. In trumpet number four, one third of the sun, one third of the moon, and one third of the stars are affected. And we talked about how each of those pieces of imagery ties in with the historical events. Like, for example, in the first trumpet, the Goths under Alaric, they used scorched earth policy. So when they went into a new territory and they conquered it, they burned everything and they moved on. So they left nothing behind, no food, no lodgings, nothing. They burned it all. Trumpet number two, which has to do with the Vandals, they, they attacked Rome from the sea. They crossed from North Africa just that small voyage or that short voyage across the Mediterranean Sea, and they attacked Rome. That's why one-third of the sea becomes like blood. Remember Attila the Hun, many of his battles were fought by rivers, and Attila the Hun was in fact buried in the Danube River by his army. 
And of course, you have the familiar imagery of the sun, the moon, and the stars, which in prophetic language often indicates the fall of a nation, which is what happens in the fourth trumpet. The Western Empire comes to an end. But the reason why one third is used is because in, in each of these events, only bits and pieces of the empire are affected. So it's not as if the entire empire is affected by these developments, but rather it's just affecting portions of the empire. And I was trying to think of a way to, to make this clear, and I found a map that I think might help a little bit. We'll see. So this map uh, chronicles three of the invasions that we've been talking about. I'll start with the... Uh, the uh, invasion of the Goths here over to the east. And I think I'll just trace this. If you follow this map, here's, here's the Goths coming in. This would be trumpet number one. They come down here into the Balkans. They move down here into Greece. Then they double up and they come back over the top here and invade Rome from the north. So you can see that red line, how it's only affecting just a portion of the Roman Empire. Okay. Then you have the Huns who are up here to a little farther to the north. They're trumpet number three. They're coming across here, and then they eventually come down here into Rome. And actually, the Huns spend a little time over in here as well. The, the Vandals, they're quite a bit different. They, they start up here in Germany. They work their way across modern-day France and Spain. They cross the Straits of Gibraltar in North Africa. They spend some time here in North Africa. Then they invade Rome from the sea. So each of these uh, invasions is affecting a different part of the empire. And notice that the east over here is untouched. Nothing's happening over there. So I think that's why the one-third, one-third, one-third keeps, keeps coming back over and over. It's, it's intended to communicate that, that this is happening in bits and pieces, that it's affecting various parts of the empire, but not the entire whole. Although when you put all four together, the entire empire is affected. So that's kind of a long review of last week, setting the stage for this week. There's one thing, though, that we didn't get to in chapter 8 last week, and that's the last verse. Let's take a look at Revelation chapter 8, verse number 13. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blasts of the trumpets of the three angels who are about to sound. So there's three woes pronounced by this angel. And what these woes represent is a conclusion to the four trumpets. The four trumpets are a bit of a unit. And then with the conclusion of the fourth trumpet, you have sort of the closing of that piece, and then we're moving on to a new piece, which involves three woes. And if you think back to chapter 7, verse number 1, back in the sixth seal, you remember in chapter 7, verse 1, John sees four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on the tree. And remember, these winds represent destructive forces, and they're being held back during this time period, during this interlude, so that the, the foreheads of God's servants can be marked. These four winds, I think, are essentially representative of the four trumpets. So each of these trumpets is an unleashing of a wind, so to speak. So four trumpets and four winds. So these four trumpets go together. They're a unit. And now we have something that's a little different. We have a shift, so to speak. Three woes and three trumpets remain. And the reason why it's repeated three times is because three is the number of God. And oftentimes in prophecy, when something's repeated three times, that's an indication that this is a message from God. If I recall correctly, when Peter had his vision uh, prior to going to the house of Cornelius, the, the vision consisted of a sheet being lowered down from heaven with animals on it. Am I got this correct so far? How many times did that happen? Three times. And why did it happen three times? 
Well, it was a confirmation that this was, in fact, a message from God. So three woes, three trumpets, uh, th repeated three times to represent God, also repeated to, uh, to make certain it's understood that these woes are from God. At least that's how I'm taking it. And these woes affect the inhabitants of the earth. So there's a distinction that's made here between the, the kingdom of men, so to speak, and the kingdom of God. And that distinction is made in a couple of other places later on in the book of Revelation. In chapter 12, verse number 12, when Satan is cast down to the earth, the heavens are told to rejoice in you who dwell in them, but woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea. For the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows that he has a short time. So who is going to be affected by the devil being cast to the earth? What's well, going to be the inhabitants of the earth? Later on in Revelation chapter 17, verse number two, talking about the great harlot, the apostate church. The angel tells John that with this woman, the kings of the earth committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the, the angel is mourning for the people of the world. He's mourning because the remaining blasts of these three trumpets are going to have a profound effect on the inhabitants of the world. Remember, God's people have been marked. They've been set aside. They've been sealed. Their souls are safe with Jesus. Whatever happens in this world is not going to affect their eternity. But what's happening in these next three trumpets is going to be real misery for the people, for the kingdoms of men. Let's just put it that way. All right. Okay, just a little bit more introduction. We need to talk a little bit about this Roman Empire in the East. And if you read about the Byzantine Empire in that little... Uh, snippet from the Encyclopedia Britannica. You're already a little bit up to speed on this, but let's just go ahead and get those mental connections going here this evening. So this map uh, shows us the Byzantine Empire in about 600 AD. So this is about 125 years after the fall of Rome. And the the, uh, is that a magenta color? Is that what you all would say? I don't know. It's kind of a reddish brown color. That's the, the territory that is ruled by the, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire in 600 AD. The green, of course, represents territory that they do not rule or the, the brown as well. But as you can see, they rule quite a bit of the traditional uh, territory of the Roman Empire. It's not quite as extensive. It doesn't get up into France. It doesn't go over into Spain. It doesn't reach up into to Britain. It doesn't go over into uh, past the Fertile Crescent into Iraq and Iran. But they rule quite a bit of territory at this point. And the capital city, of course, of the Byzantine Empire is Constantinople. So they're ruling quite a bit of the territory of the Roman Empire. And if you remember in that article from the Encyclopedia Britannica, one of the things that they noted was the, the people in this empire saw themselves as Romans. They saw themselves as the Roman Empire. And one of the comments that's made in that article, I, I hope I'm not conflating this with something else I read, but one of the comments that's made in, made in that article is, now historians, as they look back, don't really see it as a continuation of the Roman Empire. But that's how the citizens, that's how the, the rulers of this kingdom saw themselves. They saw themselves as just another iteration of Rome who's been around since the 700s BC. At least that's the traditional date of the founding of Rome. I want to talk for just a minute about the Byzantine Empire and its relationship to the Eastern Church. There's a very important event that happens uh, in 1054. We'll get to that here in just a moment. So the, the Byzantine Empire endures for nearly a thousand years after the fall of Rome. Rome falls in 476, and it's not until Trumpet 6, 1453, that Constantinople falls to the, the Turkish power that we'll talk about probably next week. But there's an important uh, division that happens in 1054. 
In 1054, there's this thing that's called the schism of 1054. And what happens is the, the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, and the Patriarch of Constantinople excommunicate one another from the church. So the Patriarch of Constantinople says, you're not a member of the church anymore, Pope so-and-so. And Pope so-and-so says to the Patriarch of Constantinople, you're not a member of the church any longer. They basically disfellowship one another. Now, this had been developing for a period of about 500 years. And there were a lot of disputes that separated the, the Western church from the Eastern church. Uh, but it really boiled down to a couple of, of main disputes that led to this great schism. The Eastern churches believed that the Holy Spirit proceeded from the Father. The West believed he proceeded from the Father and the Son. So in the East, they believed the Holy Spirit only came from God the Father, where in the West, they thought the Holy Spirit came from both the Father and the Son. The other thing that separated the Eastern churches from the West is the East never adopted the practice of celibacy for the priesthood. They allowed their priests to marry. And as far as I know, that continues to be the case in the Greek Orthodox Church and the various other Orthodox traditions that are out there. So it was over these two main issues that this schism developed. Those in the Eastern Church accepted the authority of the patriarchs instead of the Western Pope. And these are the churches that we, as I just mentioned a moment ago, often call the Orthodox churches. The Russian Orthodox, the Romanian Orthodox, the Antiochian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox, etc. They each have their own patriarch, which is sort of their own head of each uh, different uh, division within that church. They do not recognize the authority of the Bishop of Rome. So what you have developing basically is two main churches. You have the Latin church in the West and you have the Greek church in the East. Now this is important because the, the Orthodox church is going to be one of the uh, one of the reasons why I believe God raises up the Arab power, because what we see happening in Trumpets 5 and 6 is God's judgment of the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire. So Trumpet number 5 talks about the rise of Islam and the Arab opposition to Byzantium, and that is the first woe. So trumpet number five is the first woe. One woe is past. Trumpet number six represents the rise of the Turkish power. And this is when Constantinople falls and the Byzantine Empire ends. This is one of those areas where we're at a bit of a disadvantage in our Western education. We, we think of the rise of Islam as sort of like this, this single monolithic entity, but in reality, what you have happening in the history of the Muslim nations is various powers rising from various nationalities. So the Arabs are the ascendant power at first, but they are soon supplanted by the Turkish power uh, later on. So Trumpet 5 represents the Arab power. Trumpet 6 represents the Turkish power. And Trumpet 6 is the second woe. We know that from chapter 11, verse number 14. Trumpet 6 lasts quite a long time. It's got a lot packed into it. So 11, 14 is the second woe. And it seems like the third woe is probably trumpet number 7. In, in that 14th verse of chapter 11, we're told the third woe is coming quickly. And the phrase coming quickly is oftentimes a catchphrase for the return of Jesus. Jesus warns two of the churches of Asia to repent quickly or else he will come quickly. That's the church at Ephesus and Thyatira. He comforts the church in Philadelphia. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Three times in chapter 22, he warns, I am coming quickly. That's in verses 7. 12 and 20. So I think the third woe is the seventh trumpet. So each of these trumpets has a woe established with it. And the third woe is the return of Jesus, which is represented by the seventh trumpet. So that's kind of where we're headed. But just to kind of go back, I want to kind of recall some things we talked about. Uh, I think it wasn't last week. It might have been two weeks ago. Remember, there's this really interesting 
connection between the three of the sixes. You have a, a sixth seal, a sixth trumpet, and a sixth bowl. And each one of them serves a very important purpose. The sixth seal prepares God's people for the tribulation to come. That's what's happening in Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. The sixth trumpet signals that the end of the world approaches. So when Constantinople falls, that's a significant event. That's the kind of event that needs to get the world's attention. The sort of thing that should cause us to step back and perhaps rethink. And in fact, that's exactly what should have happened according to Revelation chapter 9, verses 20 and 21. When Constantinople falls, this should have been a sign to the peoples of the world, to the people of the world, that it was time to repent and prepare their souls to face their God. In those two verses, John comments that the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repeat of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So the sixth trumpet should be a signal to the people of the world that God's judgment is coming and we need to get rid of all of these things. We need to flee from apostasy. We need to embrace the, the simplicity of the gospel and the simplicity of the kingdom of God. And the sixth trumpet is also an encouragement to Christians to remain faithful, which if you think back, that sixth bowl, pardon that sixth seal, is a preparation for people to endure this time of apostasy, to remain faithful. And for the faithful, the fall of Constantinople was an important sign, and we'll get to what that means here in a couple of weeks. The sixth bowl also warns God's people to prepare. If you go over to Revelation chapter 16, verse 15, this is very interesting. In that sixth bowl, Jesus says, Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So the sixth trumpet should be a signal. The sixth bowl should be a signal. These things should get our attention. They should let us know that history is unfolding, that God is aware of what's happening, and we should take stock of our lives and be prepared for the return of Jesus at any time. All right. And then, of course, the trumpet trumpet number seven has to do with the day of judgment. So I've mentioned this word a couple of different times. I wanted to put it up here on the, on the uh, slide so that you could write it down. I've mentioned this word proleptic. And proleptic just simply means to see something that happens in the future as if it's happening in the present. So when we arrive at the seventh trumpet, we're seeing something that's going to happen far off in the distant future, at least from the vantage point of John, but he sees it as if it's happening right now. And to me, this is unmistakably the, the final day, the day of judgment. Notice what's said in that seventh trumpet in chapter 11, verse 18. The nations were angry and your wrath has come and the time of the dead that they should be judged and that you should reward your servants, the prophets and the saints and those who fear your name, small and great, and should destroy those who destroy the earth. The seventh trumpet is the last trumpet in the book of Revelation. In a moment, in the twinkling of, a, of an eye, at the last trumpet, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52. And as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, I see trumpet seven as the third and final woe. And the reason why it's placed here is what this is intended to show is that this is God's, uh, this is the conclusion of God's judgment against Rome. So the judgment day also always in the book of Revelation functions as an endpoint. It always is a period at the end of a sentence, so to speak. Once we hit that point in each one of these visions, we know that the subject of the vision is complete. All right, so trumpet five has to do with the Arabs. Trumpet six has to do with the Turks and some of the developments that happen as a result of the fall of Constantinople. Once we hit trumpet number seven, 
we arrive at the conclusion of God's judgment of Rome, the, the day of judgment. So that's kind of where we're heading, giving you a bit of a roadmap of what lies ahead. So let's get into this fifth trumpet because we got a, quite a bit of territory yet to cover and time is fleeting. Let's take a moment just to read chapter 9, verses 1 through 11. I think it's useful to go ahead and read each of these before we get into interpreting the symbolism. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them, pardon me, for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like the breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions and there were stings in their tails. They, their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. There is a lot packed into these 11 verses, and I don't think we'll be able to get through all of the details in this. But let's just take a moment to hit some of the major highlights. The first thing John sees is a star. And as we've noted a couple of different times already, a star represents a great or notable man. He sees this star fallen from heaven to the earth. This is a little different than Attila the Hun, whose star fell from heaven burning like a torch. Next is mentioned the bottomless pit. And this might take a little bit more time to unpack what exactly we're talking about. But I think the bottomless pit represents the abyss, Tartarus. This is where demons have been chained to await judgment. The abyss is another name for Hades, the dwelling place of the dead. But there's another part of Hades that's deeper, so to speak. And this is where God has consigned the demons who rebelled with the devil to, to wait in judgment. Tartarus, the deepest pit, the bottomless pit. In Luke chapter 8, verse 31, when Jesus was about to cast the legion of demons out of the man of the Gadarenes, the legion of demons begged Jesus that he would not command them to go in, out into the abyss. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to Tartarus, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Satan, later on in Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 3, is bound with a great chain and sentenced to dwell in the bottomless pit for a thousand years. So the bottomless pit is the deepest pit of Hades. It's reserved for those angels who rebelled against God. And this angel is given a key to the bottomless pit. And the giving of a key is... The, the authorization, the, the power to unlock, to open up the bottomless pit. And out of this bottomless pit first comes smoke. And smoke represents a false doctrine, an obscuring faith. When God was interrogating Job, or at the beginning of his interrogation of Job in chapter 38, verse number 2, God asks Job, who is this who darkens counsel? by words without knowledge. This smoke was so thick that the sun and air were darkened 
in the vision John sees. So you have smoke that is obscuring the light from God. And if you think about it, it makes a great deal of sense. If smoke is coming out of the bottomless pit and the bottomless pit is the place of demons, it seems that we can connect very easily the idea of false doctrines because false doctrines originate in the dwelling place of demons. What is, how does Paul describe them in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1? They are doctrines of demons. So you have smoke arising out of the bottomless pit, which is a false doctrine, an obscuring faith, but out of the smoke come locusts. And these locusts represent warriors, a consuming army that follows after the emergence of a false teaching. Locusts are often compared to armies. Judges chapter 6, verse number 5, and Joel chapter 1 are two very notable examples. The eighth plague of Egypt is of locusts who come from the east. And I think that that's a significant piece of imagery that we can link up. Because indeed, this, this false doctrine and this army is going to come out of the east. So the smoke comes first, which means the deceptive doctrine comes first, and that leads to an army following after. We continue on with some of this imagery, and again, I'm not getting into a lot of the details. I'm just trying to hit some of the highlights. Oh, I didn't do this correctly, so you're going to get the whole slide here all at once. So lots of information. Turn on the fire hose. Here we go. So these locusts were commanded not to harm. Which, if you think about locusts, if they're literal locusts, what are they going to do? They're going to eat everything they possibly can, right? But these locusts are commanded not to harm. There's a preservation of nature happening. No slash and burn strategy, so to speak. So unlike the Goths, who burned up a third of the trees, which represents um, uh, burning as they conquer, these were commanded not to harm. And notice... They're told to harm men, but not those men who have the seal of God on their forehead. So this judgment, even though it's going to affect the people of God, it's not intended to uh, be enacted against the people of God. The people of God are going to be preserved and protected in the midst of this. And the locusts are given authority to torment the kingdoms of men for five months. And five months, using a lunar calendar, is 150 days. Now, we'll talk a little bit more about this when we get into um, Revelation chapter 11, but I want to take just a moment to, to mention that sometimes in prophecy, a day can equal a year. And we have this as a fairly well-established piece of symbolism in several different passages in scripture. For example, Leviticus chapter 25, verse number four. This is where God legislates a Sabbath rest for the land, just as there are six days of work and one day of rest in a typical week for the Jewish people. So he wants the Jewish people to plant for six years and let the land rest for one year. So Six days of work, six years of planting, one day of rest, one day or one year that the land is to lie fallow. So a day equals a year. In Numbers chapter 14, verse number 34, you might remember when the children of Israel refused to go into the land of Canaan for the first time, they were subjected to wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. And the reason why God chose 40 years is because the spies were sent into Canaan to spy out the land for 40 days, 40 days of spying, 40 years of wandering. Ezekiel chapter four, verses four through six is another example where a day can represent a year. Ezekiel is told to lay on his side for 390 days, and that would represent God's judgment of the northern kingdom of Israel. He's told to lay on another side for 40 days, which would represent God's judgment of Judah. And in that prophecy, God says a day equals a year. So it's, I won't say common, but it's often the case that in prophecy, a day can equal a year. So I'm just going to throw out this as, a, as what I think is a very good possibility. 
talking about five months, I think we're talking about a time period of roughly 150 years. He also talks about the shape of the locusts that he sees. These locusts are shaped like horses prepared for battle, which would imply the use of cavalry. They have faces like men. They had hair like women's hair. They were men, yet they wore their hair long like a woman's hair. They had teeth like lions, which symbolizes fierceness. So this is a fierce army. It's a mobile army. And it's a foreign army that looks different than perhaps what people were accustomed to in the Roman Empire. And as verse number 11 makes pretty clear, all of these events are under the influence of the demonic realm. Notice that, that all of these armies are placed under the leadership of a, an angel who I presume is a demon who's given the name Abaddon in Hebrew and Apollyon in Greek. So what we learn from chapter 11 is what's happening here is, is God allowing the demonic realm to, to lead these efforts, to influence these efforts. All right. So what I believe this represents is the rise of the Arab power to oppose the, the Eastern Roman Empire, the, the Byzantine Empire. And the star, I think, represents Muhammad, the prophet Muhammad, at least He's held to be a prophet by those who uh, are Muslim. Muhammad's a very interesting man, and we could talk about uh, all the various characteristics of Muhammad, but I'm beginning to run out of time. So I think we can all agree that when we're talking about a figure in history, Muhammad seems to fit the bill of being a star. We've all heard of Attila the Hun, and we've all heard of the prophet Muhammad. <laughs> He is this star. And the smoke that arises out of the pit, I believe, represents the false teaching that Muhammad uh, brought into this world. He has a vision in 610 AD, but he doesn't begin preaching until 612. And I want you to keep that date 612 in mind because it's going to become important here in a slide or two. So he has his initial vision in 610. He begins preaching in 612. And he doesn't do so of his own accord. His wife actually sort of pushes him into this. She insists that he begin preaching. The command not to harm the earth, this seems to represent uh, the early Muslim policy for conquering. There's a very famous quotation from Abu Bakr who was the, the man who succeeded Muhammad after his death as the leader of the Arab armies. He's the first caliph. And this was his instruction to his army. Be just, be valiant, valiant, die rather than yield, be merciful, slay neither old men nor women nor children, destroy no fruit trees, grain or cattle, keep your word even to your enemies, Molest not those religious persons who live retired from the world. He's talking about monks. But compel the rest of mankind to become Muslims or pay us tribute. If they refuse these terms, slay them. And I'd like you just to notice that, that little qualifier there. Compel the rest of mankind to become Muslims or what? Or pay us tribute. That's an important little detail. And that's going to come into play here in just a moment. What, the, what I think this quote shows us is the Muslim armies, they did not destroy, ravage, or massacre unnecessarily. They assimilated lands. They did not annihilate lands, so to speak. And they were in power, or I should say, they, they went about conquering for a period of about 150 years. I mentioned the year 612 a moment ago. That's the year that Muhammad begins his preaching. And that's that smoke rising out of the bottomless pit. In 622, he moves to Medina. And this is when Muhammad begins uh, fighting. So we see a 10-year period between the time he's preaching and the time he begins fighting. So you have out of the smoke coming locusts prepared for battle. In 632, Muhammad dies, and the aforementioned Abu Bakr succeeds him. And from 632 to 732, a period of about 100 years, 
the Arabs conquer the Middle East, North Africa, clear over into Spain, and they are stopped by Charles Martel at the Battle of Tours in France. But the interesting bookend to all of this is what happens in 762 AD. In 762 AD, you have the founding of Baghdad on the site Khazar al Salam, and this marks the beginning of the golden age of Islam. And this is a well recognized, uh, important point in Muslim history. And it's not coincidental that this is 150 years from the time that Muhammad began preaching until this particular point in time. At this point in time, in 762, they had conquered most of what we would call the Christian world, or what historians would call the Christian world. Baghdad becomes the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate. The name is changed from Baghdad, the gift of God, to Medinatal Salam, the city of peace. And this represents, this golden age of Islam represents a time of internal peace. This is like the Muslims equivalent to the age of the Antonines. And Conquering sort of comes to an end at this point, and they begin evangelizing within their borders. There's little to no external expansion that takes place during the era that follows, 762. So that 150 years seems to cover the beginning of Muhammad's preaching to the shift of power to Baghdad. And just to give you a sense of how extensive this was, here's that map of the Byzantine Empire I shared with you a little bit ago. This was the Byzantine Empire in 600 AD. But this is the, the extent of Muslim conquering that begins with the preaching of uh, Muhammad and ends with the golden age of Islam. And as you can see here, I'll do a little circling. So this red territory right here represents the Islamic lands that existed at the death of Muhammad in 632. The orange, which you can see here and here, this represents territories that were added between 633 and 661. And then the yellow over here and over here are the territories that were added from 662 to 750. So you can see basically they took over most of the Byzantine Empire and stretched on into a, a small portion of what we would call the Western Roman Empire. So it was a significant, significant development. And that's why I, I really see this as, a, as God's judgment against the Byzantine Empire. So this is just another map, just sort of showing, showing the same thing. So by the mid-8th century, so we're talking about 750 AD, about the time that Baghdad becomes the capital of the Abbasid Caliphate, You've got the Umayyad Caliphate here, and this is basically the Byzantine Empire right here. So it's been reduced significantly from where it was 150 years before. And that seems to be what the fifth trumpet represents. So what I see happening is God using the, the Arab nations, the, these Arab tribes, as a tool for his judgments. Remember what's said in the prophecy. They were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Now, I'm not going to suggest for a moment that these Muslim armies were just a bunch of nice little kitty cats that were, you know, peaceful and, you know, very uh, gracious and all that. I mean, they, they were an organized army and they killed just like any army did. Well, what essentially happened is they reduced the power of the Byzantine Empire, and the Byzantine Empire never regains all of this territory ever again. So it doesn't really end the empire. It just reduces it down. It doesn't kill it entirely, but it torments them for a period of five months. So you have the empire remaining intact, but it's significantly reduced. But you also have this other element. In those days, people will seek death and will not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. And you can imagine what the response was from European Christianity to these developments. I mean, these are the sorts of things that eventually led to the Crusades, 
in the 11th, 12th, and uh, 13th centuries. So you really have a power that, had it not been stopped by Charles Martel at the, um, at the Battle of Tours, it could have just kept on going and eventually taken over all of Europe. So this really shook Europe to its core. And as we're going to see in this next quote, this was not some ragtag bunch of guys from the sands of Saudi Arabia, you know, the sort of terrible things that are said about uh, the folks over there, you know, camel jockeys and those sort of aspersions. That's, that's not what these armies were. These were organized armies. And here's just one description from Hurani's A History of the Arab Peoples. The Arabs who invaded the Byzantine and Sassanid empires, and the Sassanids are the Persians, what we would call modern-day Iran. The Arabs who invaded the Byzantine and Sassanid empires were not a tribal horde, but an organized force, some of whose members had acquired military skill and experience in the service of the empires or in the fighting after the death of the prophet. This was a real army, not some ragtag bunch of hillbillies, so to speak, as some people might like like to think of them as. But where is the church in all of this? Well, let's think back to Revelation chapter 7, verse number 3. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. Remember, that, that sealing is an important development in all this. This is God preparing his people for the sounding of the trumpets. And Sealing his people is a way of separating them from those who would be judged by the ensuing trumpets. And as you look at the end of that seventh chapter, you see that 144,000 who are sealed together with all the faithful from all mankind across the world, singing and praising God. They are saved. Their souls are preserved. So even though these terrible things are happening around them, they have not been forsaken. God has not abandoned them. He has not forgotten his people in the midst of all of this. You have in the Greek church a tremendous amount of di disputes and sects. One of the things that the Latin church was able to do that a lot of other religious bodies have failed to do is the Latin church has managed to, to maintain a largely homogenous collection of doctrine. They've been doctrinally homogenous. They, they've held things together. That was not the case in the Greek church. They were off, always suffering from various disputes and splits. So you have a lot of splinters in the, the Orthodox tradition. And what ends up happening is the Byzantine Empire would often persecute all of these splinter groups, all of these minority sects that were sort of sprinkled all over the Middle East. And just to give you a, a sense of this, there was a, a, a sect known as the Nestorians, N-E-S-T-O-R-I-A-N, the Nestorians. And they uh, wrote this, uh, one of them wrote in a ninth century chronicle. The hearts of Christians rejoiced at the ascendancy of the Arabs. May God affirm and make it triumphant. Whatever the faults of the Arabs, at least they were not Christian Byzantines. That just kind of gives you a sense of the sort of treatment that these sects were getting at the hands of the Byzantine Empire. They were persecuting all of these minority divisions uh, all throughout the Middle East when they were in control. And strangely enough, what these Christian sects found was that living under Arab rule was far better than living under the rule of the Byzantine Empire. In the 650s, uh, a Nestorian patriarch by the name of Isho Yab wrote this. The Arabs to whom God has granted at this time the government of the world did not persecute the Christian religion. On the contrary, they favor it. Honor our priests and the saints of the Lord and confer benefits on the churches and the monasteries. So what I see in this is a, a significant development. You have the power of the Byzantine Empire checked by the Arabs, and you have the Arabs being very, uh, uh, very gracious in their rule toward all of these minor 
divisions and sects all sprinkled all throughout the Middle East. And I have to think in the middle of all that, there had to be some people like us who just wanted to read the Bible and follow the Bible and not get enmeshed in all of the things that were happening in the broader world. I just have to think in the midst of all of this, there were people like us who were benefiting as well from Arab rule. Here's another quote just to give you a sense of how much these folks resented the Byzantine Empire. The God of vengeance, seeing the wickedness of the Romans, who wherever they ruled, cruelly robbed our churches and monasteries and condemned us without pity, raised from the region of the south the children of Ishmael to deliver us by them from the hands of the Romans. It was no light advantage for us to be delivered from the cruelty of the Romans. This was written by Michael the Syrian, a 12th century Jacobite. The Jacobites were another one of those minor sects, uh, Christian in, in, uh, the, in the Middle East, a, a Christian sect, so to speak. So they saw the Arab rule as something that was very advantageous. So I, I, I see this as God sealing the foreheads of his people and finding a way to look after his people, although he is executing this judgment against the Byzantine Empire. I'm going to go ahead and ring the bell here for the classes, but I'm going to fe finish this slide up real quick. All right, so just to kind of review trumpet number five real quick, we've got Muhammad who claims to have a series of visions. He begins preaching. He unites all of the Arab tribes under the banner of Islam. The Arab power conquers much of Byzantium and into some territories of the old Western empire. And I just have to think, as I mentioned a moment ago, if Arab rule benefited those minor Christian sects, then surely it benefited those Christians who were closer to the Bible's pattern for the church. I just have to think that there were folks like us scattered all throughout the Middle East who just wanted to follow the Bible, who just wanted to follow the Bible's pattern for the church, who were benefiting from Arab rule. I'm out of time. I'm actually over time. There you go, Jason. I did it for you. So, all right. Very good. Yep. So I don't think we have any time for questions and comments, but of course, you're welcome to ask me anything after service this evening. Of course, you can call me or text me or email me questions at any time. I can't guarantee I'll be able to answer them, but I'll at least take a stab at it. We're about to sing 642 in the red. This has always been one of my favorite invitation songs. I think I remember the first time I sang this song. It was when one of my the buddies that I grew up with went forward uh, to be baptized. So this song always has, uh, has that connotation in my own mind. I always... I think of him going forward and, and his baptism that day. But one of the reasons why I like this song is because this is how it should be. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, when we believe that Jesus Christ has died for our sins and we are ready to have those sins forgiven, there should be nothing that stands in our way. It's resolve. We're certain. We know the way forward. We know what to do. So if that's you this evening, if you know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, if you believe God raised him from the dead, and you believe that he died for your sins, and you're ready to confess that this evening, and you want your sins washed away in the waters of baptism, then act with the resolve that this song speaks to you. Don't hesitate. If you don't want to do it in front of all these people, grab one of us afterwards and say, hey, can we wait a little bit until people leave? And we'll get it done then. It can be at any time, but if you're ready, don't wait another moment. Let's stand and sing number 642. First, fourth, and fifth verses. <clears throat> I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. 
I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great as highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. Friends may oppose me, foes may beset me, still will I enter in. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great as highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved, and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay. Taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, we'll walk the heavenly way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, great as highest, I will come to thee. I'd like to thank Wade for coming up here uh, every week, two hours one way, and uh, it's getting more and more interesting all the time. So thank you, Wade. Uh, are there any announcements? Uh, Aiden's grandma, um, Jill, Aiden's mom, mom Jill. Uh, her Judy <laughs> Judy uh, broke her femur um, and she's going to be in assisted living for a year uh, she was told it was mandatory and she had to stay there <laughs> um, despite her wanting to be home but uh, prayers for the family because right now the assisted living place is closed it's still under COVID regulations so that they can she can only have two visitors per day for a limited amount of time and all of her there and they all want to see her together, but they won't let them. So prayers for peace for them. So yeah. Okay, uh, Aiden's grandmother broke her leg. Judy Dunn. Judy Dunn broke her leg. So let's keep them in the prayers. I was gonna say I'm gonna repeat that whole announcement word for word, but then I thought no, maybe not. Anything else? My dad's uh, sister died this week. Jerry Beatty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Jerry Beatty. You remember that family, the Brady family. Jerry Beatty passed away. Anything else? If not, we will have our closing prayer. <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, thank you for this, this time that we could gather tonight and study your word. We're, we're appreciative of this safe place that we can do this, and we're appreciative of the abilities of Wade as he comes here and, and discerns the word and, and, and gives it to us. We pray that we would use these things we learn, Father, to better understand you and, and your will. We're thankful for those words, Father. We're thankful for the great variety this Bible has. It has great history, it has great instruction, and it has great predictions of you coming back, sending your son back to bring us home to you, all of us who obeyed you. Father, we pray for our friends and family tonight, with Judy and her family, and help them feel resolved in their issues that they have to deal with there. We pray that that would go as well as it can for them. Father, we pray, pray for the Brady and Beattie families as they, they grieve the loss of a loved one. Pray that your comforting hand would be with all those people. Father, as we prepare to leave this evening, we pray that you would keep us safe and, and help us to spread our light in the world so that others can have the wonderful gift that you have given to us. Father, again, where we're prepared, we pray that you would forgive those sins. In Christ's name we ask all this. Amen. Amen.